This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. So Mark chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 27. The disciples arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. Who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, because everyone held that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Jesus said, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. These are God's words. He then began to speak to them in parables, A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Um. Mark, we are very, very lucky because my original introduction for this sermon was Malcolm in the Middle, Uh, but I thought I wouldn't subject you. Mark has a lovely singing voice, and I thought I wouldn't subject you to me hollering the tune from Malcolm in the Middle up in the pulpit. So instead, um, you might remember the show Undercover Boss. Apparently, it made a comeback in 2021, so it's recent. Um, But it's a show where the the CEO of a big company would be disguised and go undercover to work in in one or two of the branches of their business so that they could see how employees and customers were actually being treated on the ground. They would spend time in these businesses and they would see some great examples of service that they would later reward, but inevitably they would come across some sort of power-hungry middle management type who would lie to everyone through their teeth, to all those people who were above them about how great they were and what a great job they were doing, and treated everyone below them in a fairly despicable sort of way. The undercover boss would eventually have had enough, 
of seeing their colleagues, their customers, and even themselves at times treated this way. And they would come and they would confront the staff member still in disguise. The nasty employee would say something along the lines of, who do you think you are to talk to me that way? What authority do you have to speak to me like this? Then the boss would dramatically pull off their fake nose and their their wig, and then somebody off camera would shout, oh, that's so-and-so, the CEO of the company, because none of these people actually knew who the boss of the company actually was. And then you would just see the color drain from this person's face as they've realized, oh, I've just lost my job. Well, when we come to our passage today, we've seen Jesus preach and teach with authority. We've seen Jesus do miracles, cast out demons, even raise the dead with authority. Now he's entered Jerusalem to crowds, declaring him to be coming in the name of the Lord, and that he is going to establish a great kingdom in the likeness of David's. He has miraculously and authoritatively cleared the temple of those who were by the chief priests and the elders and the Pharisees doing something by their invitation, doing something which actually practically made a lot of sense. It was convenient to have the money changers and the dove sellers right there in the temple courts on the way to offer sacrifices. But chapter 11, verse 17, which references Isaiah 56, 7, demonstrates that although humanly practical and convenient, it wasn't how God said in His Word that the temple should be used, and it wasn't how God said in His Word that worship was to be done. And to add insult to injury, it was also corrupt. According to verse 17, they were robbing people, likely by overcharging. So Jesus drives out those the religious authorities had invited in. When we turn to our passage, it is likely the next day of what we've come to call Holy Week, and Jesus returns to the temple in verse 27. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders are, I think it's safe to say, absolutely raging with Jesus about what's happened. So they come and they ask these questions in verse 28. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you authority to do this? Now, we, the the readers of Mark's account of Jesus' life, we've been clued in to exactly where Jesus' authority comes from, right from chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We know that Jesus is the true undercover boss, confronting these wayward religious leaders. So the question for us to think about this morning as we hear God's Word proclaimed is, does Jesus' authority come from God? And what does that mean for us? And although Jesus doesn't explicitly reveal his authority here. I think the passage reveals three ways in which we see that Jesus's authority comes from God. We'll see that Jesus has divine authority as the true prophet of God in chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. We'll see that Jesus has divine authority as the Son of God, chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. And then Jesus has divine authority as the chosen cornerstone of God, chapter 12, verses 10 to 12. So, let's delve a bit further into this passage and see why each of these ways we see Jesus have divine authority are important to us understanding who Jesus is and all that He's done for us. So, firstly, Jesus has divine authority as the true prophet of God. Chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. We've already thought about verses 27 and 28, and the questions that these particular leaders asked. In verse 29, we see Jesus's response. He says he will tell them where his authority comes from if they first answer his question. The question is in verse 30. John's baptism, Was it from heaven or from men? 
Tell me. Now, although he appears in the New Testament, John was in the in actuality, the final Old Testament prophet, calling the people of Israel to repent and to prepare themselves for the imminent arrival of the Messiah. And he was instructed by God to call the people to be baptized. And although similar, this wasn't the New Testament baptism that Jesus instituted. In those days, a a baptism or a, a ritual washing was required for anyone coming from outside Judaism wanting to enter into the covenant people of God, a washing off of the sin of the nations as they became part of this covenant community. The religious leaders were angry about what John was doing for two reasons. Firstly, how dare this man claim that Jews, the covenant people of God, also needed to engage in this ritual cleansing of themselves in preparation for the Messiah coming? Secondly, they were angry because according to chapter one, or chapter 1, verse 5, all were coming to be baptized. Not literally everybody, but huge crowds of people, whole families, all coming, hearing, and believing the words of this God-sent prophet rather than them. And this is the dilemma that they find themselves in, in verses 31 and 32. They refuse to even contemplate the truth of John's claim. But they know that the majority of people do see him as a prophet. And so they do the only thing that they can and refuse to answer Jesus. And because they have refused to take Jesus' questions seriously and fail to even consider that John may have actually been a prophet sent by God to call them back to repentance and further God's plan of redemption. In verse 33, Jesus seemingly won't answer their question of where his authority comes from. However, although he doesn't explicitly tell them the answer, because the time for his arrest and trial and death has not yet quite arrived, He actually has already answered their question through the question he asked them. What is Jesus' question in verse 30 asking? Do you accept John, who was sent by God as a prophet, baptizing people in preparation of and, and pointing forward to me? Do you accept John, who said one mightier than him was coming, who would baptize people with the Holy Spirit? Do you accept John who baptized me and saw the Spirit descend as a dove? And my father's voice say to me, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus knows that whether they speak or not, their answer is no. The undertone of this is that Jesus is saying, well, you've rejected my prophet one who called you to repentance. So you're going to reject me, the final, full and true prophet who comes to call his people to repent and believe the gospel. Some of us here might be very religious. We come to church faithfully. We might like being a part of this community, but repenting, believing the gospel, following Christ. Oh, sure, God, God accepts us just as we are, right? I'm a decent person. Some of us might come here because we're dragged here each week by a parent or a partner. We might even come like these religious leaders claiming to follow God, but rejecting much of what he has taught us about who he is and the life that he has called us to in his word. I wonder, are you rejecting Jesus this morning, like these leaders did? The one who is the true prophet, God made flesh, come to live the perfect life we couldn't live. The one who calls us to repent of our sin, the sin that cuts us off from our God, and follow him the one who shows us the way to live for him, 
the one who willingly gave himself as a sacrifice on our behalf, so that those who accept his call will be freed from the awful consequences of sin and be truly washed clean forever, covered by Christ's perfection, and welcomed in to live forever in God's perfect, glorious presence as his beloved children, because of the beloved Son. Jesus came to rescue his people and call them to follow him. Many of us have accepted that life-saving good news. But if you haven't yet, what are you going to do with Jesus today? If anybody has questions about that, don't leave until you've spoken to somebody. The prayer team, Frank, myself, someone you trust. So, we've seen that Jesus has divine authority as the, as the true prophet of God come to declare that He is the way of salvation. And in chapter 2, verses 1 to 9, we see that Jesus has divine authority as the Son of God. Jesus teaches a parable using the example of a vineyard, an example probably reasonably unfamiliar to most of us, but one that would have been very familiar to the people of Israel, not just because of the abundance of vineyards all over the land, but because the vineyard was a picture throughout Scripture representing the people of Israel. Jesus here actually bases his description of the vineyard on Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 7. It says this, let me sing for my beloved my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a, a, vi a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness but behold an outcry. The destruction of the vineyard in Isaiah is referring to the destruction and exile that would take place because of Israel's long-term and continued unfaithfulness. The fact that Jesus would pick up the motif of this vineyard is demonstrating that although Israel had returned from exile, there are still problems in the vineyard that the owner, God, is going to have to rectify. In verse 1 of our vineyard story, we see the owner, God, has invested heavily to create a beautiful, protected, well-designed vineyard for these workers to manage. God has made us a, a perfect world in which to live, work for, and worship Him before we brought sin into it. In verse 2, the owner rightly wants his vineyard to produce good fruit. Our perfect, all-good Father wants his people to live for him and follow his way, so he sends his servants to check on the fruitfulness of the vineyard, the holiness of his chosen people. But we see in verse 3 that Israel, and, and more specifically here, those responsible for the vineyard, the leaders from chapter 11, are seeking their own benefit from what rightfully belongs to God. And so, they reject the owner and his servants. 
Instead, they serve themselves and fall increasingly into sin and rejection. First, they beat a servant. Then they attempt to kill another. And then they do murder one. And then many more. Rejection of God and His ways never leads to freedom or even neutrality, but always to increasing enslavement to sin and sinfulness. In verses 3 to 5, we see that the, the powerful owner of this vineyard shows incredible patience and grace with these wicked tenants. He continues over a long period to keep sending servants to call his people to repent and produce good fruit for him. But it is constantly and increasingly rejected. Finally, in verse 6, the owner sends his son. His son who carries all of the owner's authority with him. Surely they will respect and respond to him but instead they reject him also, thinking they can be the owners of the vineyard, that they can be gods of their own lives. And so they reject, kill, and cast him out as trash. We see in verse 9 that although the owner has shown such undeserved grace in the hope of these people's repentance, that for those who reject the Son and His authority, they will face the full, fair, and just judgment of the Lord of the vineyard. We know that the many servants sent here are a reference to the prophets, called to go to God's people and, and call them back to live for Him. Many of them, including John, were rejected, beaten, treated shamefully, and even killed. This role of of calling one another to constant repentance and refocusing on our Savior and the life He and His Word calls us to is a role actually given to all believers in the New Testament, but especially to the elders as those called by God to have spiritual oversight of His people. Because just like Israel, Like these religious leaders, God's people now are also quick to reject and neglect the life God calls us to through the authority of the Son. We are quick to forget all that God has done for us in sending the Son to save us and fall back into living for ourselves, falling into the old sins that no longer define us or control us. One of the purposes of church is to week by week remind us that we, as believers in the Son, are new creations, who now find our identity in Christ and no longer in our sin, and to remind us that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit who shapes and molds us to be more holy and Christ-like as we engage in the the spiritual practices that God has called His bride to do, being in the Word, prayer, hearing preaching, being taught, being together in worship and fellowship and sharing together in the sacraments. These very ordinary things are how God works to mold and shape us by His Spirit. So that we as God's people, those others in verse 9, who have inherited the vineyard through the death and resurrection of the Son, will increasingly love our vineyard owner, serve and work for our vineyard owner, and by the help of His Spirit produce good fruit for the owner of the vineyard. So Jesus has divine authority as the true prophet of God come to declare his way of salvation. Jesus has divine authority as the Son of God come to make salvation real through his sacrificial death at the hands of those he came to save. 
And finally, we'll see that Jesus has divine authority as the chosen cornerstone of God. Verses 10 to 12. Jesus quotes from Psalm 118, verse 22 here, a psalm that was believed to be messianic. And actually the same psalm that the crowd sang from as Jesus entered Jerusalem a few days earlier. Jesus knows what he is about to face. Death at the hands of these leaders. A brutal physical death where Jesus, the the perfect sacrificial lamb, also takes the spiritual punishment of all his people's sin onto himself and deals with it. His trust in the Father and the Scriptures means that he can face what's coming, knowing that his rejection and death, however awful, will lead to his resurrection and the resurrection of all of those who trust and follow him. He is the cornerstone, the capstone of our faith, the necessary brick that bears the weight and holds the whole structure up. He is the one appointed by the Father from all eternity to rescue His people from their sin and restore them to a right relationship with their God, giving them, giving us this glorious future as His people in His renewed kingdom. In verse 10, Jesus asks this question, haven't you read this scripture? Now, Jesus knows full well that these religious leaders had an excellent knowledge of the words of Scripture, especially the Torah, the first five books, and the Psalms. Many in this group had likely read this verse many, many times. Some probably knew this Psalm by heart. But although they knew the words of Scripture, they didn't understand them. Why? Well, we already know why from this incident. They rejected John because he challenged their power, their ease, their culture. They were rejecting Jesus, the Word made flesh, for the same reasons. They had power, influence, ease. And Jesus called them to to give it up and follow him as his servants. That didn't suit their lifestyle didn't suit what they had chosen to believe about themselves. You see, the teachers knew Scripture, but they came to it not as humble servants, recognizing that every word is God's Word. Someone reminded me the other day about those, those red-letter Bibles. Do you remember those? With all the, the, the words of Christ in red, Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.16-21 says the same, um, paraphrasing, but it says, no prophecy or Scripture ever came from man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. I don't know if anyone still has a red letter Bible, but you may need to go home and get out your red pen, start coloring in, because every word of Scripture comes from God, Father, Son, and Spirit, even the ones that we don't like. These Pharisees and teachers had it half right. They knew the Scriptures, but they came to them as lords over the Word, rather than servants under the Word. What about us? Do we know our Bibles? To be fair, these teachers absolutely put us all to shame in this regard. But we need to know the Scriptures. We need to know our Bibles so that we can understand the structure of it, how it works together, and the context of what's going on throughout it so that we don't read bits of it in isolation and and go off in all sorts of weird directions. 
And we also have 2,000 years of Spirit-led, tried and tested creeds and confessions and catechisms that sum up and help us understand what's going on in the Word. But unlike these teachers, we also need to come to the Word like Christ did, as God's unchanging, perfect Word, given through Spirit-empowered men by a sovereign, all-powerful God. We need to trust it as true, even when it plainly says things we don't like or that challenge us. We need to live by it as God's very words given to us to show us His better story for humanity, His gospel, His good news to sinful, forgetful, rejecting people. That through the authority of the capstone, Christ, we can be freed from the consequences of our sin by the finished work of the Son and welcomed into the beautiful vineyard of God. His authoritative prophetic word shows His redeemed and rescued people how to grow in the holiness and Christ-like life that all true believers should now desire to live by the help of God's Spirit who dwells within us and empowers us. So, does Jesus' authority come from God? Yes. In this passage, Jesus, the, the dodgy religious leader's undercover boss, reveals that he is the true prophet, the Word made flesh, who has revealed God's saving and sanctifying Word to us. He is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, God enfleshed, eternally appointed by God to be His people's Redeemer and bring us, who were God's enemies, back into God's beautiful vineyard. And He is the chosen capstone. Our salvation and future rests not on our good works, but on His finished work, which redeems His called people, fills us with His Spirit, and gives us the power to live changed, holy, and fruitful lives. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Are we still rejecting Jesus like these leaders did? Or do we see Christ's finished work for us as marvelous in our eyes? Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.